light and Christmas just go together. <clears throat> and coughs. <laughs> no, light and Christmas. I mean, I suppose every community in America lights a Christmas tree, right? <clears throat> we have one at Market Street. Now, the center green is not completed. I'm sure some contractor's in trouble, but the tree is up. <clears throat> There's the lighting of the National Christmas Tree in Washington, D.C. That's always a highlight, beautiful occasion. A few years ago, Bev and I happened to be in New York when they were lighting the tree at Rockefeller Center. And what an exciting time that was, and romantic, really. You had the orchestra playing, you had the outdoor ice skaters the skyline of the great city. I felt like I was part of a movie, really. <laughs> Wonderful. Light and Christmas, <clears throat> they just go together. Many of us, I'm sure, have traditions where we pile into the car, put in a CD of Christmas music, drive around searching for just the right streets to look at the Christmas lights. And we know where those streets are, don't we? Some of the best are in Oak Ridge. Got some great streets there. A few in the woodlands. And they're known for their decorations. So many people want to see these streets that it's like a traffic jam, really. Word gets around. You know, word got around even before social media. Yeah, it's amazing. It was at the beauty shop and the grocery store, and the post office, but we all learned where to find the special winter wonderland kind of streets. And let, let's not forget the prominent place light has in scripture, especially when it comes to Jesus. We remember the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Why all the emphasis on light during Advent? Because Jesus is the light of the world. The light of the world. That's what the Bible says. His light broke into the world that first Christmas in the form of a baby born in a manger. A light sent from God. Why? To save us from our sins. Charles Wesley's great carol says it best. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. That's why Christ came. To reconcile us to the Father. The carol continues, light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Lest any of us <clears throat> miss the point, Jesus himself, during the course of his ministry, said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the life, the light of life. Friends, this light provides more for us than just illumination for our paths. In Jesus, we find redemption. In Jesus, we find acceptance. 
In Jesus, we find understanding. In Jesus, we find a safe place. In him, we find a warm welcome. That's what we're going to talk about today. You know, during this Advent season, we've been exploring this idea of making room, rediscovering the joy of community. We've talk, talked about making room in our own neighborhoods, connecting with those around us. Last week, we talked about the strangers in our midst, people who might be feeling alone, far away from home on this Christmas how we might minister, how we might, how we might put our arms around them. Today we're going to talk about making room, going out into the community to make room for those who are on the margins of society. The people who might, might feel like they don't belong anywhere, anywhere. Now, while working on this sermon, I could not help but think about television commercials because one came to my mind. Commercials on television have power. You know that. They're very influential. That's why these companies will pay millions of dollars to broadcast them because they have power to influence Super Bowl has become as much about the commercials as it is the game on the field, you know? What do you talk about the next day? Commercials. Some become iconic, you know? The Energizer Bunny, we all know immediately. It, it, it tells us more, we understand. How about a more current one? Geico's, you know, little green lizard with that with that Australian accent. And of course, there's the Chick-fil-A cows, you know. One that I remember came to my mind working on this message is in a monotone voice, often on the radio, sometimes TV, hi, this is Tom Bennett. Tom Bennett, do you know that? In his monotone voice, he talks about Motel 6. And he always ends with, you know, remember the tagline? We'll leave the light on. I think we might have one of these. It's kind of cute. I'm going to show it. <laughs> we get a room too. <laughs> light is a universal symbol of hospitality. A way of saying, you are welcome here. Halloween night, if you're out trick-or-treating with the kids, you look for the houses with the front porch light on, correct? It's a sign of hospitality, saying you're welcome here. Now remember, the Bible says Jesus is the light of the world. He said that about himself. I am the light of the world. When he was born in Bethlehem, a star from heaven marked the place. John's gospel says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Notice how scripture draws contrasts. Light, darkness, good, evil. We use those kinds of phrases in our daily language all the time. We might speak of someone as having the dark night of his soul. Or we might say of ourselves, I feel like I've just been wandering around in the dark. It's not positive, is it? No. Conversely, look how we speak of light in a good way, a positive way. We'll say, well, ah, I'm beginning to see the light. That's good. Or, it's been rough, but I feel like there is light at the end of the tunnel. 
we use these words and phrases and they symbolize something we understand. Dear friends, let me tell you, let me tell you a truth. Our world today is covered with darkness. So many people at the core, at their very core are sad, stumbling around, lost, aimless, experiencing life on a superficial level, trying to mask over that inner emptiness, that barrenness of the soul. Oh, that we might look up and see the great light. Oh, that those who are trapped in deep darkness might allow that light to shine on them. Listen, my friends, when Christ was born in Bethlehem, God turned on the light of heaven. And God longs for his light to shine on everyone. God longs to lavish each of his children with his divine love. He aches for you to experience Christ's light, the light of life. And so when heaven came to earth, God opened his arms wide. Jesus did not come merely to invite us to his home. No scripture says he came to seek and to save the lost. He came searching, looking for those who felt unwanted, for those who feel unworthy, for those society has scorned or pushed to the edge because everyone matters to God. To others, these kinds of folks were given a label, a name. So many in the world in which Jesus inhabited, so many were labeled as outcast unclean, unworthy. And we know from scripture that so many people had difficulty with certain kinds of people. But to Jesus, to this light which broke forth, which dawned upon us, these people were not cast offs. Rather, they were people to love and to welcome and to embrace. Now, we know from Scripture that so many people had difficulty with that. The thought of engaging with society's cast-offs was shocking to them. The religious leaders of the day were horrified that Jesus dined with tax collectors and ate with sinners, that he would ever say, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree for I must go to your house today. No, they were scandalized. The religious leaders could not understand him for forgiving the adulterous woman. Adulterous women were to be stoned, not forgiven. That was the moral code, the moral understanding of that day. I wonder if Jesus' love for those that were pushed to the edge, those who were marginalized by the community, I wonder if it dated back to the treatment of his own mother and father, unwed parents. I mean, honestly, how could they explain to anyone, well, it's not quite what you think it is. Imagine how that must have been with that stigma in those days. I wonder as Mary nursed Jesus, if she whispered into his tiny ear, always love everyone. Jesus, remember, all people matter to God.
I wonder, I wonder if she placed a special concern on Jesus' heart for the ones in society who've been pushed aside, ostracized, deemed unworthy. Might this, might this be part of the reason that our Lord always noticed those kinds of people, the ones that were labeled sinners, and embrace them. You see, throughout his ministry, we see Jesus going out of his way to include those that others excluded, extending love where it was not expected. Even his own disciples at times expressed shock. Remember when Jesus was teaching, the crowds gathered round, the numbers swelling, the people listening raptly, and there were some kids, some children, started coming toward him. The disciples rebuked them and pushed them back, but Jesus stopped them. I mean, the disciples in their minds, I mean, children had very little value in that ancient world. Children have very little value in much of the developing world today. Push them aside. These squirming, noisy kids were just a distraction. But Jesus, Jesus insisted. He said, let the children come unto me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Well, children were one thing, <laughs> but lepers, lepers were altogether something else that was simply beyond their comprehension. Oh, Jesus, you're crossing a line now. <laughs> no, don't do it. But Jesus insisted, Oh, lepers were dangerous. That's what everyone believed. They were unclean and, and contagious, so they were shunned by society, kept away at a safe distance. But Jesus touched them. Now, do you know, he didn't have to touch them. His word alone was strong enough to bring healing. On several occasions in Scripture, Jesus simply spoke and healing came. He could have kept a distance. So it's interesting to note that Jesus intentionally reaches out, touching those who were hurting, those who were ostracized, as if to say, yes, you have value too. You are welcome. There's room in my father's house for you as well. This kind of radical hospitality was beyond their comprehension. It was beyond the Pharisees' comprehension. It was beyond the Sadducees' comprehension. It was beyond the scribes' comprehension. It was beyond the Sanhedrin's comprehension. It was beyond his own disciples' comprehension. But Jesus insisted. Why? Because everybody matters to God. Now, in Jesus' day, as in ours, there's a tendency to, op to categorize people. You know, generalize, categorize and to do so in such a way that it begins to dehumanize. I mean, after all, isn't it always easy, easier to lump people together? Isn't it more convenient to categorize them than, and generalize than to take time to know them as individuals? We do this for numbers of reasons. We do, it, we do it based on race. We do it for appearance. 
Sometimes it's your accent, your grammar, your level of education. These days, it's who you voted for. Oh, can't be in the same room with you. Sexual identity, sexual identity. The list could go on and on. Now I'm told, I've got to check this out, but I've heard. You put a hen with different markings in a coop, different from all the other hens that are in that coop, that over a period of time, the one that looks different will be pecked to death. I'm not positive yet if that's true of chickens or not. It seems to be true with people. Often society as a whole might dislike or distrust anyone whose lifestyle is contrary to the norm. And we peck away. One group of people often stigmatized or the homeless. There's a tendency to categorize them as being lazy. I mean, how can you not have a place to live, a home, really? They must be just lazy. We have a ministry here at this church called Family Promise. Some of you are involved in it. We house homeless families, helping them to get back on their feet. Ask any number of our members who serve in that ministry. We do it over at the loft, it's perfect upstairs, the youth area, once a month. We cooperate with some other churches. The goal is to get them back on their feet. You ask any of the members who serve in that ministry and they will tell you that their experience is these people are not lazy. That's hardly ever the explanation That's rarely their problem. The issues which lead to their homelessness are complex. And for many of them, they just need a helping hand so they can get back on their feet and back into a safe place which they can call home. Now back in biblical days, ostracizing was common. Certain people were unwelcomed by society. The general rubric was they were unclean. Sinners, who are the sinners? The people that, whose sins are different than mine. They're the sinners. Lepers, tax collectors, women who had slipped, made a mistake. To the Pharisees, they were people to be scorned, kept at a distance. But to Jesus, they were people worthy of embracing and he insisted on going to them too. He was determined to take God's light, God's light into the realm of their darkness to make sure that they felt welcome. It's interesting, Jesus did not associate just with people who were like him or people who shared his values and his faith, and his convictions, and his spiritual commitment. No, Jesus crossed social lines and went out to those on the margins. He widened the circle. He was always about making a bigger neighborhood. And we're called to do the same. Yes, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But on another occasion, he turned it around. And to those all gathered around him, he said, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp, then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it can give light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You know what I I think, I've got a hunch, 
that if Jesus were here today, he would tell us to get off our cul-de-sacs and outside of our gated communities and to take Christ's light to those stuck in darkness, to those less fortunate, to those who are hurting, to those who have frankly made a mess of their lives. People back in Bible times, they understood darkness. Darkness they knew. For them, light was a luxury. They didn't have street lamps, not, not as we do. On a dark night, if you were traveling, the world could be a scary place. Roads were treacherous. You were thankful that there were cities built on the hillside. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, Jesus noted. Those communities, those cities served as beacons. And if you're traveling, you can know the right direction, the right path to take. And you would know there'd be safety when you arrived. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. The apostle Paul used that same imagery when he told us that we are to shine like the stars. You know what makes me so proud of this congregation? That I see you shining all the time, all the time, in big ways and little, in Harvey kinds of ways and little. Let me tell you a story. It's a confession, really. This fall, I've been sensing, I think, I need to get out and have some hands-on experiences in local missions. I preach about it. I like writing sermons about it, John. <laughs> I thought, I need to do that. I've shied away because I'm not very handy, frankly. Ask Bev. And I always think, what can I do but get in the way? So I talked to Sherry Llewellyn. She works with John. Sherry is in charge of local missions. I said, I'd like for you to find something that I can do and let's get it arranged. It's okay, give me, let me give a little thought. Two or three weeks go by. <laughs> She's still trying to figure out something that I can do. <laughs> then one day she says, I got an idea. How about you and Bev's invited also what we, how about breakfast in the park? I said, I like that idea, breakfast. I love parks, all about parks. She said, well, this will be in Conroe. And we actually, what it is, because I was curious, she said, we feed the homeless. I said, oh, yeah, we do this one once a month. And I said, well, that sounds good. So we have to get up early, have to skip morning golf, you know, go to feed the homeless. Everybody takes something. So we have maybe 60 people from our church. Like we arrive, 60, 75, I'm not sure. And, and then another 75 to 100 homeless people there. They've gathered. Let me tell you what happened. People said, oh, pastor, it's so good to see you. I find that interesting. What I would expect is, oh, pastor, you finally came. <laughs> no, they let us be right there serving the people as they go through the line. You know what I observed? These homeless people, they're very bundled, heavy coats, bulky, bundled. And you see it like that, don't you? Wherever you see homeless. And I started thinking that's because everything they have, they've, they've got on, or they're pushing it in a cart. I began thinking, they carry a heavy load, a lot of baggage. I began wondering what other kind of baggage they were carrying, emotional, scars from childhood. Well, when we finished, Sherry said, well, you know, if you have time, I can show you one more. I said, we got something else going on? Oh, yeah. 
well, where is it? She said, well, it's really not very far if you want to just follow me. I said, okay. Habitat for Humanity. Our 13th, I've learned now, 13th house, this church, you, your gifts, and for so many of you, your labor. And the recipient, what a ministry, what a program. The recipients, they have to be engaged. They have to be involved every step of the way. So there was the family hammering away. There are people, men and women. Again, pastor, always so good to see you. I'm just shrinking more and more. When we finish, I say, well, that was marvelous. Thank you so much. She said, well, I don't want to be pushy, but since I have you today, this morning, I could show you another. I say, well, I've got my sermon I got to finish, and it may be about local missions or something. I don't have time to do that stuff. So I said, okay, where is this one? She said, well, it's at the Lost Building. I said, oh, family promise. No. I said, well, what is this? She said, I'll show you. We drive here. We get out. I go in, and there are about, oh, there are maybe 8 to 12, I didn't just count, people there. And then inside of one of our rooms there, there are the clients. Who are the clients? They're poor people below 250% of the federal poverty line that need help with legal matters. I say, well, where do these lawyers come from? They said, we're your members. I said, oh, I didn't know we let lawyers in the church. (laughs) They go every, I mean, it's not always the same at different configurations. We got enough lawyers. They make sure we have a dozen or so every Saturday with some social workers in order to help these people who are needy happening here. Oh, I see your light shining in so many ways. I'm thinking of our dear president who just died, George H.W., his phrase of a thousand points of life. I think we have 13,000 points of light here. After we finished, I thought she was teasing. She said, well, there could be one more. I really thought she was. I said, you're kidding. No. I said, where? Right across the street, the Family Life Center. And you know what was happening? Our children's staff and our youth staff combined to put on a party for the children that we do angel tree presents for whose a parent is incarcerated means in prison behind bars not with you at Christmas maybe for many years and our youth staff and youth and our children's staff put on this grand party and I go and it's a festive, glorious party. And they were having the times of their life. I see you shine all the time. The way you respond to Christmas miracles and that angel tree, about 1,500 tags, all gone. (laughs) They're all gone. You take them. That means every one of those, some child, some lonely adult, some needy person is going to receive a gift because of you. Now, I don't know at what point you say, we're over time, we're going to be, so just who cares and keep going, or you quickly start editing. But if I can say it, you can hear it. I'm going to just tell you, we've got a little bit more to go. Last Wednesday, I bumped into this person. I could tell this person recognized me. You know, when I'm out and you can tell someone knows you and, and this person was so good to come and introduce herself. And she says, oh, you're my pastor. I go to your church. I said, wonderful, that's our church. She said, yes. I always ask, well, what service do you attend? This one happened to be sanctuary. Could be any number of. And I said, well, tell us, when did you get acquainted? Tell me about yourself. How long have you been in the church? Just a couple of years. How did you find us? I said, well, that's a story. I said, I have time. She said, I'd really had a bad experience in church some years earlier. I thought I was through with that. I was burned out on God. But she said, after a period of time, I started feeling, sensing something missing. 
something missing in my life. Some friends told me about this church, so I came, but man, when I drove up in the parking lot and I saw this, I just overwhelmed. I thought, that's not going to be for me. She said, I came inside and people were so warm and welcoming. And she said, then the sermon that day just, just knocked me off my feet, right to my heart. I said, yes. <laughs> she said, I'll never forget Rob Renfro was preaching. <laughs> said, That's true. This is all true. <laughs> I said, you know, it's warm and friendly, but if you don't get involved in some smaller group, it might start feeling a bit cold and distant. You need to find some Sunday school or Bible study and somebody say, oh, I'm involved. I said, you're involved, good, good. How are you involved? Oh, she said, you have that back to school project? When I first came, they were talking about it, and I thought that sounds like such a marvelous thing to help these children. And so after a few weeks of coming, I asked in the church office, is there a way I could help too? And they said, sure, and they got me connected. She says, you know what? Now I'm one of the leaders. <laughs> Light shining in darkness. Isn't it interesting that God shined heavenly light upon his son that very first Christmas night, a light shining in darkness, and the world has never been able to put it out. It started with Jesus, that one candle, but it spread. Christmas Eve, how can that not be our favorite service? We come with such expectation, such excitement, festive clothing, children all abuzz. We come to sing carols. We come to receive Holy Communion. We come because something seems right about joining together in community and singing that final carol, Silent Night. And then we pass the light and the pastor takes his candle and he goes to the Christ candle. He takes the light symbolically coming from the Christ candle. And then the pastor lights the candles of the gathered ushers and the ushers begin going down the aisles and it passes and in the balcony and the chandeliers have been turned off and the spotlights and it was so dark in that one little candle at first only, but it spreads and it fills the room and there's a glow about it. And we sing silent night, holy night. Son of God loves pure light, radiant beams from thy holy face with the dawn, the dawn, the beginning of redeeming grace. Jesus, Lord, at thy birth. I want to close with a brief story. It's not mine. It comes from Victor Hugo in his great novel, the Hunchback of Notre Dame. A powerful story of this hunchbacked young man who was feared by the townspeople, shunned, run off. Over the years, this powerful story of Victor Hugo's, it's been made into a number of movies. The one most of us probably are most familiar with is Walt Disney's animated version and their characters, the lead, of course, Quasimodo, that hunchback young man, he lives up in the bell tower at Notre Dame Cathedral. And Esmeralda, that beautiful young gypsy girl, both are shunned by society. The hunchback, because of his distorted, frightening appearance, he seemed like some freak, scary thing to the townspeople. Esmeralda, because of her family connection. Family, yes, she's a gypsy, born a gypsy. I despise gypsy. There's this touching scene where the young gypsy is running from her life from these bad guys who are trying to capture her. She darts in to Notre Dame Cathedral for sanctuary, for refuge, for safety. And while in there, 
She pours out her heart to God in prayer. I want you to hear these words. I don't know if you can hear me or if you're even there. I don't know if you would listen to a gypsy's prayer. Yes, I know I'm just an outcast. I shouldn't speak to you, but still I see your face and wonder, were you once an outcast too? God, help the outcast, hungry from birth, show them the mercy they did not find on earth. God, help my people, we look to you still. Oh God, help the outcasts or nobody will. I want you to hear this. Listen, dear friends. (laughs) 
Here's the message. God leaves the light on for you, for me, for everyone. And that light shines, that light shines as an invitation saying, come home. It shines for the, it shines for the lovely, the talented, the successful, the religious, yes, but it also shines for those pushed to the edge, to those shunned, avoided, easily overlooked. Those who find themselves on the margins wondering if anyone cares. God help the outcast or nobody will. Here's the good news of Christmas. God came for the outcasts too. He's made room for them. His light shines on them too. He welcomes us all into his home. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.